Welcome back to the audio workshop, homie. In this part, we're going to demonstrate how the range slider input can be used as a seek slider and a volume slider. We'll also demonstrate how you can achieve a consistent slider appearance no matter what browser visitors are using to view your audio software. Because a terrible inconsistency exists. Because all browser vendors are jerks. They don't sit down and have a meeting once a year and decide upon a standardized look for components because they're idiots. We're going to continue with the script we left off with at the end of video number one. If you happen to need that script, follow me quickly and we'll go grab it right now. You can go to developphp.com and in the videos JavaScript section, I put a new section in the table of contents for the audio workshop. So you can just click audio workshop and it'll take you to that section. I click the first video and here's the script down on the page. Now keep in mind at any point that you want you can externalize your CSS and externalize your JavaScript. Okay so right in between the play pause button and the mute button I'm going to add a range slider. You can see this is an input type of range that produces the slider component. Now we've given it an ID of seek slider. Its minimum value that it could be is zero. Its maximum value that it could be is 100. And the value that it is by default is zero. The step is set to one to give you a free smooth flowing slider. Now right next to the mute button we're going to add a volume slider which is pretty much the same setup except it has a different ID of volume slider. Its minimum value and maximum value are the same as the seek slider, but its default starting value is going to be 100. That means all the way up because our volume starts at 100%. Now if you were to start your volume at 50%, you just change this to a 50. Now let's file preview that in Chrome. Now you see the way the sliders look? Now let's file preview that in Internet Explorer. And that's ridiculous, isn't it? That's a ridiculous difference in appearance. Not not only for developers is it bad, it's bad for everybody using the internet. We're going to fix it. Okay, so let's open up our CSS and just like how we targeted all the button elements on the page, we're going to target all of the input elements. And for now, we'll just make sure they all have outline none because we don't want that ugly blue outline to appear. Now let's go and target the two sliders directly and we're going to give them different widths. I want the seek slider to be a little bit wider. Really that could be any width that you want. So I want my seek slider just a little bit wider than my volume slider. Now finally in the CSS we're going to add all of the little hacks and workarounds prefixes that you need to target various browsers to make it look the same in all of them. And the code I'm going to apply make sure that it looks the same in Internet Explorer, Firefox, and Chrome. Any environments beyond those, it's up to you to fix. Okay, so all of this code right here, I just popped in right there from line 25 all the way down to 65. And what we're doing in this rule is we're targeting the input type range using the standardized syntax. And we're just making sure for WebKit, the appearance is set to none. And then you can go about styling your range slider. Now these two rules are for targeting Internet Explorer. This helps you style the track. And this one is for Firefox to help you style the track. Now this is for the little thumb, the little knob. This rule is for WebKit. This is the knob rule for Mozilla Firefox. And this is the knob rule for Microsoft Internet Explorer. And you can play with all of these properties to make it look exactly the way you want it to look. Now let's preview this in Chrome. Okay, now I have the slider look that I want in Chrome. Now File, Preview in Browser, Firefox. Looks very much the same. You see how similar the slider looks in Chrome and Firefox? That's what you want to do. You want to get a consistent appearance in any way that you can in all the different browsers. In a year or two, they'll be using standardized syntax more than likely. And all of these little prefixes will be gone. We won't need them anymore. So let's also preview that in Internet Explorer. Okay. 
It looks pretty much the same in all three. Bring up Chrome again. Get Internet Explorer back. And you can see Internet Explorer adds a little white thing around my knob. But when I'm dragging it, it looks the same as it does in Chrome. But that's no big deal. Okay, let's go ahead and collapse our CSS. Or if your CSS is externalized, you don't have to worry about it because it's not going to be in your way here anyway. And all we have to do is go into our JavaScript and program these to work, which is not very difficult at all. So let's expand our JavaScript. And since we already have the seek bar variable, all we have to do is add another one for the volume slider. Now let's set object references for the seek bar and the volume slider. So really you can just copy this mute button object reference. And make sure you target those elements by their proper name, or their proper ID rather. And then put the ID there, and then the variable name goes there. Actually, let's change seek bar variable to seek slider. That makes more sense. Now you can just copy that one and do the same thing for volume slider. Make sure you get the right ID and put it here. Make the same variable name out of the ID. And just make sure it matches here, where we're initializing all of our variables. Now we're going to add the event handling for those two elements. So let's just copy the event handler for our mute button. Let's change it to seek slider dot add event listener. And let's just type in code right there for now. And we're going to change the event to mouse down. It's when the user mouses down on something. Now let's just copy that and we're going to add another one and change it to the mouse move event. So anytime the mouse moves, code is going to execute. Now since we're going to need to target events, we're going to use a function here where the code goes. So you can see for our mute and play button, we just simply put the name of the function that's supposed to execute here. But for the seek slider, we're going to pass the event to the function that handles the listener. So we wrap everything in a function nest. And then as an argument, we're passing event. And the code that's set to run in that function are these two little lines. Seeking equals true. So we need a variable called seeking up here. So let's put that in. Seeking. Initialize the seeking variable. Now the seeking variable is going to toggle in between true and false. And it's part of the logic that our application needs. And then the next line that happens in that function is we fire off a function that we're going to write in just a sec called seek. And then we pass the event as an argument to the seek function. Now for the code part of the mouse move event, it's going to be a very similar thing. We're going to wrap everything in a function nest. And the only line that runs in that function nest is seek. Instruct the seek function to execute. Anytime the mouse moves, every time the mouse moves even just a little bit over the seek slider. So all we have to do is put this function seek into place. Now before we do that, let's add the event listener for our volume slider. And that's going to be mouse move as well. And we're just going to execute the set volume function that we're going to write right now. And since we don't have to pass any event as an argument through it, we can just put the function name there. All right, now let's go down to our functions and right after the mute function right here, if you want to put little comment lines in between all of your functions and maybe a little note to yourself, you can do that just to separate them all. Okay, so when the mouse moves, anytime the mouse moves over the volume slider, the set volume function needs to execute. So let's put that into place here. Function set volume and there's only one line needed. What you do is you take the audio dot volume property and you change it, make it equal to the volume sliders dot value divided by 100. So as the user's sliding the volume slider around, you take whatever value that is, you divide it by 100, and that will properly set the audio volume. Now let's give this a test in our favorite modern browser. Beautiful. So as they drag, or as they tap, they can just tap it anywhere in the bar or anywhere along the track. All right, so right above the set volume function, we'll add the seek function now. This will operate the seek slider. 
Let's pop that into place. So we have function seek. And remember, we're taking in that event that we were passing through initially as an argument. Now we pass event as an argument, that way we can access whatever the element was that's making the event occur. And the code within the seek function is very simple. We first put an if condition to see if the seeking variable that we set into place up here is equal to true. You can see when the user mouses down on the seek slider, we set seeking to true. That means only when they mouse down, seeking is going to be true. That means only when their mouse is down and they're dragging, are we going to make it actually change the track's position. Because if their mouse isn't down and their mouse moving over the slider, you don't want it to change the track's position. Only if they're dragging it and they have their mouse down. So that's why we put this if condition in place. If seeking is true and only if seeking is true, then we're going to take the seek slider's position and I'm going to explain this code in just a second. But before we explain these three lines, I'm going to add one more event listener to the seek slider. And this is what changes seeking from true back to false. So we have a new event listener for mouse up. Then we simply change seeking to false. Now let's explain those three lines very quickly. What we're doing here is we're changing the seek slider's value. We're making the slider's value equal to wherever the user's mouse is over the slider. And we do that by saying event.clientx, that means where the user's mouse cursor is, or their mouse pointer. And we subtract the seek slider offset left position. That way we get the exact position of where their, the mouse is over the seek slider. So basically you're just making the seek slider knob value where the knob is, where that little thumb knob is in the track. You're making it equal to where the user's mouse is over the track. That's what that line does. Then we create a variable called seek to, which this could be, actually, since we don't want to assign any variables in our functions, let's remove that var. Let's take this seek to, and let's also make this one of the variables that we initialize for our program. That way we don't need any var nothing. We won't be creating any vars within our functions. We're just going to be changing a variable. Okay, so we say seek to variable is equal to the audio dot duration property multiplied by the seek sliders dot value divided by 100. So the part in the song or the audio track that you're going to seek to is the full audio duration times the seek slider dot value divided by 100. Then finally, after we figure that up, we can change the audio dot current time property to the new seek to position. Now let's make sure our seek slider works. Okay, turn the volume down a little. Now as I click in the track, it should change the track's position. Go back to the beginning by clicking. Now let's drag in there. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and collapse up all of my JavaScript, so it's not in my way. And we'll continue on in video number three. And in video number three, we'll add the time display. And we'll also make sure that the time update process makes our little seek slider knob follow the position of the track as the current playtime changes. So you have to make the little knob on the seek slider actually move by itself according to where the track is. So that's what we'll take care of in part three, and maybe we'll throw in some other stuff in that part as well.